one thing that, that would just stop this overnight, but I don't see it happening anytime soon, is if energy prices were to really go through the roof. These places are so energy intensive. Uh, the electricity for the fans, for the lighting, for the mechanized uh, way that they work, that they're only profitable, A, if energy prices are low. Now, energy prices are low, but if oil were to go back up to $100 a barrel, if it were to go to $200 a barrel, my prediction is we would see a lot less. It would just become too expensive. Uh, which leads me to, to my second point, which is subsidies. And we hear about farm subsidies. You hear about the farm bill every few years. Most people, when you talk about farm subsidies, you can almost hear their eyes glazing over. It's, it's not a very sexy topic. But that is what is perpetuating this system. Millions, if not billions of dollars in taxpayer money that goes to subsidize the corn and the soybeans and the grains that these animals eat and to subsidize the actual CAFOs, the feeding operations themselves. And it's crazy because if you look at the food pyramid that USDA puts out, at the top is meat and dairy, and then below that is fruits and vegetables, and then at the bottom are, are, are grains. Um, and it's almost inverted. So that what happens is meat and eggs, chicken, are artificially, the price is artificially lowered. But without subsidies, fruit and vegetable growers, which get, again, they're at the, 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 the middle of the pyramid, but they're getting the least amount of subsidies. So if you go to your supermarket, you might see pork shoulder on sale for, for 99 cents a pound, and then you go to the broccoli, and it's 249 a pound. So we have our priorities as taxpayers and as a society complete, completely flipped around. We're subsidizing the least healthy food at the expense of the most healthy food. And Americans are on a budget. And if you want to feed a family of five, you're probably going to opt for the pork shoulder because it's cheap, because that meat was subsidized by federal taxpayers. Um, another thing that could really help the situation, you know, a lot of young people are leaving rural areas. Um, it's very hard to be a farmer. And when you're competing against these giant factory farms with their subsidies, with their reliance on antibiotics and other uh, substances, um, you just can't be cost effective. And we need to find ways to invest in rural communities, to buy grants and loans to young people who want to stay on the family farm, who want to keep those farms operating, but so many of them are being bought out because they just can no longer compete with their neighbors down the street that have 10,000 cows instead of maybe 100 cows. Um, and I did go to farms where they raise their animals on pasture and they rotate them just the way a farmer might rotate his or her crops so you don't deplete the ground. And it's a beautiful system, it's a closed system. So the cows and the chickens and the pigs will be on one pasture until they eat it down and they're fertilizing that pasture for the next season. And then they move them to another pasture and then another pasture. They don't rely on antibiotics. They don't rely on hormones. They don't need um, heavy metals or arsenic. These animals are feeding how they were evolved to feed. And they're returning those nutrients back into the soil at a sustainable rate. We're not spraying these fields with concentrated thousands of gallons of waste. This is a natural process. This is how animals are supposed to live. So they save money on the front end, and then they can sell their products at a premium because it's grass-fed, or it's organic, or it's free-range, which there's some problems with that terminology. But these farmers are actually doing very, very well. And they don't need to raise as many animals to make a living uh, because their costs are lower and because they get more for their products. Um, the other really key to this is um, slaughterhouses. And it used to be that a farmer, say you're a pig farmer, say you have 50 pigs that are ready for slaughter, you might have five or six smaller slaughterhouses in your area, and you would pick up the phone and say, what are you paying for hogs today? How much a pound? Well, with this integrated uh, model, business model, 
these companies, these, these Tysons and Purdue's, they control the slaughterhouses. And so a lot of the smaller regional slaughterhouses have gone out of business. And if you're Farmer John with your 50 pigs, it's extremely difficult to get your animals into a processing plant. What these plants, they operate 24 hours a day, three shifts a day, and they want 1,000 pigs that are exactly the same size and the same weight because the machinery is calibrated to slaughter those animals and they can do it very, very efficiently. They don't want to deal with animals of different sizes. They don't want to deal with small quantities of animals. And this effectively blocks these farmers from the market. If you can't process your animals, um, you can't sell your meat or your eggs or your milk. And one solution that has been proposed, and it's not really happening, is to, again, subsidize or, or encourage not only smaller regional slaughterhouses, but even mobile slaughterhouses, where they will come to your farm and process the chickens or the pigs right there on the spot and then they can be sent off to market. Um, it's like an hourglass. You have all of these animals here, but then you have a very, very small area where that can be processed before it goes back out to the mass market. So in, in my mind, the subsidies and the slaughterhouse are what are perpetuating the system more than anything. And that can be fixed. We need political will. We need public policy. We need public outcry. We need to support family farmers, small farmers, sustainable farmers, and it's just not happening. So a lot of the power does rely or, or lie with us, the consumers. You know, people in this room may not consume any animal protein at all, um, but if you do, there are ways that are actually affordable because yes, sustainably raised meat and dairy and eggs are more expensive. Um, but there are ways around that. One is farmers markets often have locally produced um, products. Uh, there are CSAs, community supported agriculture, where you pay a certain amount of money to a farmer every year and then you get a certain amount of product back. <clears throat> There's the whole farm to table movement. Um, and there are ways that, that consumers can say, no, I, I'm going to pay $2 a pound more for my pork because I know that this pig was raised humanely and sustainably and did not pollute the environment, did not pollute the water or the air, and that the meat is healthier and cleaner and doesn't contain all these contaminants in it. Um, a lot of consumers, it's worth it to them. And if more people did that, yes, you would have to eat less meat, but that is actually a good thing. Americans consume too much protein. Um, the typical American man could cut his protein consumption in half and still get enough protein every day. And so when you're cooking, you know, let's say you buy four chicken breasts, which means at least two chickens, <laughs> you know, had to die for, for that meal. Um, instead of feeding each person a whole chicken breast, you could take that breast and cut it up into slices and saute it and stir fry it with vegetables. And you've now stretched one chicken breast into a meal for four people instead of four chicken breasts. And again, we already consume too much meat. So I think that consumers, aside from energy, hold the key here, and, and that's us. And if you refuse to buy these products, even though they're cheaper, um, if you eat less meat, if you eat less dairy, if you eat fewer eggs, you can balance that out. You're not spending as much. You're spending more for each piece that you buy, but overall, you're still feeding your family at an affordable rate. And if more people did that, this system would start to, to crumble and disintegrate, and these companies would find that they were having a harder and harder time selling their products. Now, a lot of these companies are starting to open up organic branches or sustainably raised branches. Um, humanely raised, but most of them still, I think something like 95% of our animals are grown on these factory farms. And again, the small farmers, the sustainable farmers, the more humane farmers just can't compete with this massive industry backed up by taxpayer money, 
filled with money from lobbyists, Farm Bureau, politicians that have been bought and paid for. Um, the system is entrenched, but I think one day we will start to see more diversity. Again, if you look at Europe, um, Eastern Europe not so much, but Western Europe, they have very, very few factory farms, and they still manage to feed their people. Um, if you've been to France, if you've been to Italy, the food is delicious, and it was raised in a humane, sustainable manner, and people can still afford it. So it doesn't have to be this way. Um, it's just so profitable for these, these, these companies, and a lot of those profits, again, get turned back into lobbying for government officials to, um, to not do anything. So, oh, and, and one other um, point I just wanna make about consumption, 2015 in this country saw the largest increase in meat consumption in 40 years. Meat consumption in the United States was steadily dropping each year. And suddenly in 2015, it just skyrocketed. It just shot up. And I was just reading about it, and that's because the price of chicken went so low. Because of these subsidies, because we can produce chicken so cheaply, the, the market got flooded with too much chicken. And the price went down, and people started eating more chicken. They weren't eating more beef. They weren't eating more pork. They were eating more chicken because the price came down so low. Now, again, I know how hard it is to feed a family. I know what it's like to go to the supermarket, and you're looking at price tags, and you know one is $1.99 a pound, and one is $3.99 a pound. Your instinct is to go with the cheaper one. But we are actually victims of our own success in raising animal protein in this country. I would say it's too cheap, partly because it's subsidized, partly because of the way that they raise these animals. They can do it so much more efficiently, cost effectively. Um, so if the prices went up, we as a nation would start consuming less. And we wouldn't have to produce as much, and we would be much, much healthier. So it's, um, it's not a happy story. People are suffering, animals are suffering, not only the animals in the farms, but animals in the water, uh, fish, other marine animals, aquatic animals. Um, and our, our health is suffering from breathing this stuff, from eating this stuff, from being near somebody who's been infected with swine flu. And I think that eventually the scales will turn. I don't know when. Again, it may take a huge crisis. It may take a spike in energy. It may take another disease outbreak, the likes of which we have not seen before. Uh, we could get a bird flu or a swine flu, like I said, that has mutated to the point where it's extremely deadly and extremely infectious. And then I think people would start asking questions. Is this really the way we want to feed our country? Aren't there better ways? Uh, you can employ a lot more people on small, sustainable farms than you can in one big factory farm. And you can keep families on the land and they can make enough money to support themselves. And if you did it in a much more small scale, diversified way, you would actually see employment rates go up and that would help the economy as well. So it, it is that economy of scale that, that's hurting us. I didn't really go, even go into the economic impacts that these farms have on rural communities, but it's quite devastating. Um, the trucks chew up the roads. Uh, they, they bring in migrant workers which need health care and education and, and public assistance. Um, sometimes there's some crime associated with some of these populations, and it can be very devastating on rural communities. So um, just think about it next time you go to the supermarket and think about what your alternatives are and what you as a single individual citizen can do to try to help turn the tables, support smaller, more sustainable farms, and take a dent out of these massive profits that these giant companies, giant powerful companies are making.